So again, a massive thanks. Um, I think that's probably enough for me actually. So let's keep it as interactive as we can. And like I say, just fire the chat through. Other than that, I'll hand over to Don to, to kick us off. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks mate. Um, but evening everybody. Um, hope, listen, I hope you're well and appreciate everyone signing up. So I guess the intention of the next hour um, is two things. One is to keep it to an hour because I've got a tendency to get overexcited, talk for too long. Um, so I'm sure you can nudge me in the right direction. Second one is probably to outline, um, I guess, what we're trying to do and a few things, kind of give you a bit of understanding without teaching the suckheads and what is the pathway, because I think it's a really general term that gets lobbed around and, and actually help you under, understand at least how we're seeking to define it, what it is, some of the things we take into consideration. Then I guess um, try and nudge everyone's thinking a bit on, on how we would try and develop ours, build it, actually you know, some, some considerations for yours. I know that the title was Talent Framework um, and what it is. I'll come to it later on, but that's certainly something we're we're building due to launch soon. Um, and, I, and I think as we go through, like all I will want to do is try and make some things clear. Like there is so much in this topic. Like I could talk on any one, one of the things we're going to touch on for hours. Um, not saying you would enjoy it if I did, but I think it, it's so broad. So I'll apologise for being a bit headline. If there are things you want to dig into in a bit more detail, um, just drop a note in. I'm very happy to try and leave time for questions at the end or some discussion. Um, and what I've tried to do for those of you who pre-submitted questions is as best I can at least try and build some of that content into, into what I'm about to present. Um, because I was trying to be flashy, I've used a bit of new bit of software, which crashed um, about two minutes before I went online. Hence why you were let in at five. So um, we're going to give it a go. But there you go. Is that working, Sigs? Thumbs up. Um, hello. Yeah, there you are. Um, so, look, what, what I want to try and do then is is talk to you all about um, a few things. So, really, the the systems that you know I, I'm a part of, that you're a part of, the approach we'll try and take to it, and then just a little bit around, I guess, a nudge for everyone to consider their purpose a bit and purpose of your programs the the purpose that people individually will take on and, and how that might influence what we're trying to do and, and certainly some of the things we think you want to do um i guess the frame of this this is a really global presentation right this is very headline i'm going to cover some big topics it's, it's certainly not the detail it's not the nuance it's it's you know i guess unapologetically going to skim over some things that if I make a statement, you think, where on earth has that come from? Or what is the evidence behind? Or, or feel free to drop a note and I'll happily articulate it. I guess what we're going to try and say is built on a good evidence base, but it's always hard. So I can see. Um, everyone looks at the screen then when I uh, I say that bit. Everyone sort of suddenly refocuses. As a show of hands, if a one hand um, was... I think I have a good idea of what the pathway is, as we would band it. Um, like a one hand up is I know a lot about, I think I know what the pathway is. A no hand show is I'm not actually sure. Where would you all sit? Give me a, give me a room gauge. Mm. Bit of mixed, mixed bag, I'd say. Fair. Um, so look, the, the thing I'm going to try and, and get to, I guess, then is a, a place where you can all um, understand what the pathway, I guess, is from our side of things and, and how it affects, um, I guess, what we do. So this. Give me a thumbs up if that's zoomed in. Is that zoomed in? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so pathway as we extend it really starts uh, when you look at it, it's an all encompassing thing, right? So on its broadest place, it's around saying everything from community clubs and schools all the way up to the England senior team. Now, what we always need to be clear of as we, we will go through, um, I'll probably try and just give you a slightly tighter definition when I refer to it today. Um, because yes, it can be everything. I think what I want to try and do is define it. Now, when you look at this piece here as well, you're going to see, um, it's got some clear stages on the left hand side in terms of purpose so actually some things we really want to try and work at each stage of, of it and then an overall aim um, it talks around preparing players for a world leading England team now we've updated this recently and I'll show you um, I think I'd call it if I was being flashy 
I call it a beta version of uh, what we're trying to work on moving forward, which means it's a really rough picture. Um, but that has been, you know, and we are updating it, I guess, in line with some of the things. And I think just also to to, to put, put out the start, okay? So I am very clear that responsible for a system where if, if you take success and if you mark success in, in this kind of pathway system or an academy system as those who will go on to play Premiership Rugby or for England, okay? then we won't be successful if you take that in its definition because the vast majority of people who then go through this um, are not going to make it. So we need to be about a bit more than that. Um, and look really clearly the system isn't about isn't about just going on and people playing for England, okay, because it is so boring. And so many people will come into it. And like you say, the vast, vast majority are not going to go through. So I think the only way you can judge um, its success, and, and I, I say this and, and people will, you know, you'll have a different reaction, you'll have a different response to it. You can only judge us really in terms of how effective we are and how a system is working by the people that leave it. Because the people that leave it are the ones who will give you an honest opinion. Um, those kids who stay in it and progress through each stage, they'll always tell you things are going well. You'd hope you get to a stage where it's honest, but you can only judge it by those who leave it and we have to be accountable for that. And that's always an aspiration of how we seek to get better. So three things I want you to consider. Okay, everything I talk about today, just just take off your kind of hacks a lot of you will sit here as coaches um a lot some of you will sit here as kind of leaders of a system okay so you might not be a coach but you might be a, a director of sport you might have a broader remit um and i also want you to kind of take on the hat of a player so i know there's some younger bodies here and there's a few older bodies a bit creakier so some of us were close to it but you know there's three things we always try and consider so that playing view that coaching view and then someone who's involved in the system so that could be an administrator could be a parent could be anything. Everything we do, you've always got to try and hold those layers in mind. Okay, so anyone at this point, well, actually, I'll get you to type it. What, what's the purpose of rugby, if you're a player, in the system early on in this pathway? What do you think the purpose should be? Anyone brave enough just to whack it into the um, into that time box? So what do you think the purpose of rugby be, should be for players? So why, why should they come and do it? Cool, thanks. Yeah. I was going to say, Tom, can you see all that? Yeah. Yeah, I've got some stuff picking up. They're really, like, really interesting, right? So um, you look at it, and uh, I'd say vast majority there that's pinging through my screen is about enjoying it and having fun um, and being engaged in it. And, and there will be a few comments around um, actually fulfilling potential and, for, you know, getting, to, getting through to stages. Now, Clearly, and I, I genuinely mean this, like early on in, in the pathway, so when we're talking about clubs, schools, first engagement, um, I, I think the job is just to create a good experience for people and actually <clears throat> stop, stop thinking about it in terms of like an end point and actually start thinking about, well, how, how good an experience can I create for someone? And that, that says, you know, that's broader than players, so put that other hat on. So what does it mean as a coach? What does it mean that someone who's involved in the system? Um, there's a good, some, you know, and I fully agree with you. There's some comments here that if people start to have a good experience, positive engagement, they'll stay in it. Um, and if you want to have some players that will go through, you know, into our world and become professional, then they've got to learn to enjoy it at a point because it's not always going to be easy uh, and it does get tougher. And some of those experiences will be initially perceived as negative. So you, you just have to grow people's love. And it's a different mindset, I think, rather than saying, well, it's about, it's about having fun. Well, let, let's start to think of it as how do I create as good an experience as I can? Um, I guess what does that lead to? In leads to um, leads to that. Look, virtual air horn. See, bit of fun. Um, told you it was good, Mike Hart. Some of these graphics. I told you you'd enjoy them. Um, I think that, and that's the main thing. Like, actually, if the pur if the purpose is for players to have the best experience possible, um, and then we start to go on and say, you know, I will caveat this um, because we, I think we've got into a, a stage probably in recent times where. Sometimes we blur the line between a good experience always has to be initially perceived as positive. Um, and just to go back, now that's not an excuse to say treat people like crap and make them not have a bad time. But, you know, for those of you, you know, you're, you're all, you're all, you all have a family for, in, for some part. And, and actually those conversations you have with family are not always about um, having fun, not always about enjoying what, what they do do is challenge you and actually Again, if our purpose is to, to give you a great experience, or sometimes 
you know, some of those things will be challenging um, and they will be tough. And in the long run, you'll go back um, and you'll, you'll look at them and you'll enjoy them. But actually, we've also got a bit of an onus to, to support people, prepare them for some of the tougher ones and the tougher things. And we know we've done some great research projects. Um, and again, I'll happily sort of talk about them at a separate time. Um, you know, we've done some great research projects where we know every time a player transitions in rugby so selection deselection change of age group change of school change of club um, into an academy into a pathway that there is a bit of stress they perceive stress um, happens all the way through we know that actually those transitions if managed well can be really positive for people not just in rugby but learning to, to develop some of the psychosocial skills that bring you forward um, but again they're not always perceived as positive initially so I think we have to be careful tons of stuff out there about players going through a rocky road and you know again that that means that we will perceive challenge um, again you as a coach you as a player you as a, an administrator you have a you have a role in helping people I guess embrace some of the challenge um, support them through it and then and then actually realize how they've grown from it so when I talked when just again when I talk about pathway today um, and I get you're here with schools and colleges and, and potentially this 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 will hopefully lead some of the richer conversations um what i've defined it as here just to sort of click on it for you anything here that has a purpose that's slightly stated above that of, of engagement um retention and i think that you know you could say is a first step or a step towards a a possible potential career in professional sport so that's how i'll refer to it today so schools and colleges um you know, I'm sure some of you come on at the end and say, well, hang on, are we not part of the journey that gets you towards professional sport? I think, yes, I've had some, we've had loads of good conversations, really, but I think around primary purpose. So a lot of people who are employed into those programmes, their job is to help develop that player experience, but ultimately with a direction towards becoming a professional. I think when you look at schools, colleges, there's a huge remit responsibility, pastoral care, education, um, you know, personal development. It's, it's primary purpose isn't to get you towards professional rugby definitely is a key stakeholder in it um, and can be really supportive and, and, and a huge influence in doing it but just in terms of my referral to their pathway that that's how I how I talk about it so what I want to nudge you on okay back to the start okay so we're going to go back to the start line what are we trying to do or I guess what am I trying to do um, I want you to think about a system okay uh, and, and why it's important and I guess the the challenge would be, I want you to, to learn or think about a global direction. Okay, so why would we have a global direction, a, a central philosophy? So is anyone here a bit of an etymologist? Anyone here keen on their word history? Anyone got an idea what that means? You've got to be quite brave to have a stab at this. Um, so this is like an old kind of like, old Germanic based word. I came across it in a good book by a bloke called Robert McFarlane who writes about um, walking nature and other stuff but it, it, he he phrased it's a really old English word so Lisnogen it means literally means to learn by following a track um, and I think it's a really important piece to bear in mind um, you know there's loads of you here working in schools um, colleges universities okay we we accept that learning doesn't start and stop at a point um the same with development right you don't turn up somewhere and develop we don't go blow the whistle ring the bell you're now learning for the next hour i'll blow it again you can turn your learning off and we go like it the whole thing is a journey um we talk about academies we talk about systems now the things we tend to get heated about or we tend to get frustrated about when we is specific experiences so very individual moments in time that we get um either frustrated or you can pin a moment i learned a lot then but the whole thing is a journey okay the whole thing's experience if we start to design something and just look at individual time points you're never going to do it well um, i think it's around bearing the end in mind okay so where do we want to get to and then what do we think the journey is we're going to take you on to get towards that um i love the word because you know it talks around it talks around you're going to go through to um you're going to go through and play or learn or study at different time points and there's going to be different ways you're doing it but you are you're going to kind of get through this journey um and i think that's important i guess look, andy appreciate you've dropped me a message privately around county divisional england 18 counties like 100 i'll pick that up at the end as a, a question or a point because i think it's important to address and 
I'll be as honest as I can on it. Um, so just back on that. So what do we want? Okay, so in no way um, do we want to go and tell you exactly how you should do things, okay? So in your club, in your part of the country, in your, um, you know, environment, in your school, college, uni, you, you will know, like, I guess people will talk about culture. What's the simplest definition of culture? I, I think you could probably say, well, how it is around here, right? So you'll know how it is around here. So if I turn up um, to somewhere and kind of, you know, with one set of kind of ideas, beliefs, that, that just might not be how it is around here. Now, it doesn't mean I'm wrong. It doesn't mean you're wrong. or doesn't mean I'm right or right. But what we want to try and get to is a stage where um, we have one really clear direction. So a reference talent framework that, that will come out in the next um, few months or, or by the summer, which will be how England rugby think we should be considering thinking about talking about those players with potential okay to go on a journey what do we want at each stage what things we think we should consider now don't you know we can you can argue specifics on everything but actually what what it's never going to be is say someone needs to be x height x weight um right so there are so many variations there are so many different things but there are also some some really important bits i think you need to consider when we do it so we want a central direction and then we want you guys to be able to go and put um you know your flavor on it so Actually, what's important for one club may not be important for another. You may have done different things or had different focuses. So that's important. We'll give you an idea of the way to travel. Um, we want you to go and work it out and ultimately work with your, well, you know, your coaching family, your staff, your your parents. Engage with all of those to kind of work out what it means around here. So there's some broad stages, okay, with a clear purpose when you looked at that first picture. Um, everything below under 18 on that little um, triangle you saw, if you remember, so explore the boundaries of player capabilities. Um, so that that was the that was the kind of really clearly stated aim at the start. So why do we do that? Well, we want you to think about the journey. What's the, what's the end point? The end point is we'd love a player to be capable of winning the World Cup. Um, now to go and do that, and if you start to break down the component pieces, the physical needs, the rugby needs, the game understanding, the psychosocial um, points, I think all of that requires travel that requires development that, that doesn't happen at a point um so think about the journey what do we want to do with under 18s and back to everything you listened in that chat group um in the main you want people to enjoy it right so we want people to to go and enjoy now again the research link will say that um people like to head towards you know they, they like to get towards competency they like to get towards a place where they feel they're accumulating skills and knowledge um Back 10 years ago, what did coaching look like? Well, very different than it does now. Loads of games-based stuff now. Loads of um, chances for people to adapt. Loads of, I guess, exploration. That, that's what we want. Um, back to purpose, right? So we wanted all of that exploration. We wanted people to enjoy. And actually, that, that was felt as, A, it fits the stage of the journey. It kind of fills your toolbox. Um, gives you loads of experience. Gives you loads of broad. And equally, it fits that purpose of, well, how do we create good experiences for players? Um, I think it's aligned, I guess, in your environment. So those of you in schools, um, you know, the age range of a school, certainly from a you know, a 12 year old through to an 18 year old. Well, what, what's that journey? What do you want an 18 year old leave thinking about? Those of you in unis, you're picking up an 18 to 21, 22 year old. Again, well, what, what do you want to take them on? And actually, how do you build component parts? And I guess if you step everything back, well, what, what's important that staff understand? What's important that parents understand? Um, I think it's about being really clear again with people and purpose. So, little quiz for you again. You need to type. So, there is a bit of engagement. This is only as a type as much as you have to type the word agree or disagree. Okay, that is all you need to do. Um, do you agree with this? And I'll, I'll kind of explain it. Everything that everybody does has a good intent. Agree or disagree? Give you a minute to think about it. I can see two so far. Anyone else? Just make sure, give me a little type. There we go. Oh, there's lots coming in, mate. Here we go. Yeah, sorry, mine was a bit slow. There you go. Yeah, that's fine. Sid Holt, 
I mean, you are on the fence there with agree to a point, aren't you? Hey. <laughs> Um, is anyone prepared who has who has agreed with the statement? Actually, can I have someone who disagrees with the statement? Is anyone prepared to unmute yourself and tell me why you disagree? Will anyone mind or share? Right, I'll, I'll have a go. You Thank want. you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I guess obviously you wanted it completely related to this topic of conversation, but ultimately... Some people act on stuff that they know is not going to have, or well, it's going to have a poor outcome, or um, you know, it's going to have bad intentions to it. So, um, to the fact that you can say everything that ev everything it would be the bit that I would take out. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, makes sense. Um, thank you for sharing as well. Appreciate it. it's always tough to ask people to unmute. Can I? Can I have an agreeer? Any agreeers who might want to challenge? Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think that every every player should have that within their within their mind. I think everyone, when there is a is a way to get to an outcome, the end, the intent will always be there. There always be an intention to get to that point, and whether it's a good or a bad one, it's, it's still an intent. And, and I think personally that the, the majority of what players do has a good have a good intent uh, to, to get to those outcomes. Um, uh, I'm going to ask one more. Who's NMPC7? Um, you wouldn't mind explaining why you've changed, would you, to disagree? Just need to unmute, Matt. Yeah, Can you hear me? Yeah. I think most people do intend to do that, but I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of practice and I've known people that have deliberately put themselves into situations where they've become a selector of county sides. I've seen people who have become selectors of under eight, under 14 district sides, et cetera, et cetera. And to say that they push certain players to be in those sides based on those players' abilities is sometimes a little bit suspect. So there's a lot, there's quite a bit of nepotism, put it that way. So that's not everyone doing things with good intent. If you try and put a player in a squad because you're in a position to be able to do that at the expense of someone else who, to be honest, they know is a better player. So that what, player's not necessarily from their school, from their club, from their whatever. So, what would you think their intent is, though, Matt? Uh, like, um, what would their intent be, like that person in, as an individual? Well, it all depends, doesn't it? If they get a player in a county squad and that represents their school, well, there you go. There you go. If it represents their college, their university, their whatever, it's bums on seats, getting that sort of exposure. So. I initially agreed, but having said that, I think there are a few that not only use their position, but try to get themselves into a position where they can have that effect. So, uh, listen, I thank you for sharing that again. Like, I really appreciate people jumping on to unmute. Um, someone challenged me with this years ago, right, just to kind of tell you where this has come from. When I was, um, I was struggling to understand how... I guess similar some decisions have got made within a coaching context and um, you know where, where it come from. I think the the piece that got me here is every individual when they make a decision, and sometimes you you know you all sit and you might not understand why a parent has come to you in a certain way, or one of your co coaches has done something, or a, you know the dean of your college or, or uni. Like everyone will have a reason to make a decision. Now, their intent as an individual will probably be aligned with something they see as a positive, right? So the frame that I've tried to shift people to, and I just wanted to put it out today because we get engaged, and I certainly get engaged with a lot of conversations between schools, colleges, and academies um, or England teams where um, if we say, well, is your intent <coughs> to help that young person develop? Um, everyone nods their head and... Um, and goes, yeah, no, we, we definitely want them to develop and uh, have the best experience. Um, 
Now, when you say, well, how do you think you should do it? Um, that's when I think you you get into a different place because actually people will then have a different individual thing. And I just want you to hold that sense because loads of the conflict around pathway and player development, I think is driven where everyone actually has good intent. They want the person to do well. They want that individual to go on and do well and, and be represented. But actually where it starts to misalign is when they have a, a different view of, um, of actually how you'll get there or actually what good looks like. And I, I just think maybe just hold that thought as we, we kick on. So, I guess next up, okay, is one of the things I want you to talk about or, or maybe just discuss and take away and, and talk about your things. So it's this. Um, I think this whole space of talent development um, is around your need to embrace paradox, okay? Because if I say to you, well, do you want to win a game? Uh, do you want to win the game on Saturday or do you want to develop players? Like, which one is it? And you'll all probably go, well, a bit of both, actually, I think. Um but on some people, you'll think they dial up one more than another. Now, we'll always talk development. But does development mean that, you know, in all honesty, when you you stand on the side of the pitch of your team, like inside, you're not really going, oh, I want to develop, but I really do hope they, I want them to win it. And it doesn't mean the players don't talk about it. They're desperate to. Of course it does. I think it's around how we frame things. So outcomes are not important right on the development pathway. If we win, brilliant. If you don't, don't. If you win every game, you're probably not actually helping your players develop. Similarly, if you're losing, we always think somewhere in the middle. You wouldn't want to win or lose more than 75, 25% of games either way. It's, it's important. Everyone has both experiences. But you need to embrace paradox. You know, is it about Saturday or is it about five years' time? Well, it's, it's, it's both. And I guess just, is it about, you know, in some cases, or is it about performance or is it about development? It's, isn't it? Is it both? We have to, and I think that there is so much paradox in this. And the danger you all get into is when someone tells you it's one or the other. Um, the whole system, the whole talent space is about, well, just get used to, um, you can't probably get to, you can't get to one answer. You can't get to both things. It's about both things. Um, so just to um, uh, unpack this one a little bit. So this picture, just talk about exploring boundaries, stage one of our purpose. What do we want to do? So what, what does it look like in, I guess, with the frame or the lens I try and put it from a, um, you know, a system thing. Well, what, what we'd want to do and what I guess a lot of you who work with under 18 age players, both male, female game, you'll see a lot of adaptive games you, you see in coach education that will start to get people to use skill zone breakouts. You'll get to um, a space where we, we want quite a few questions asked. Actually, what do you think? How should we do it? How would you beat this? Create a challenge, go and do it. That, that's the space that you'll get flooded with when we talk about it. Um, it has a really specific impact on coach education. It has a really specific impact, I think, on the, the things that players are good at. So if you ask a lot of academy managers what do players look like now as an under-18 when you make a decision on the contract, um, now they'll say they're actually excellent games players. What they are very, very good at is playing games. Like They get on a pitch and they... Where I think the current feeling is people might be... Um, probably deficient is the wrong word, but lacking actually is in some of the technical skill. That, that's probably been deprioritized as an element of the game so people are not quite as proficient um as they used to be in some of the, the how do i throw this ball in how do i you know you've got you've got some you've got hookers that can kick brilliantly and, and chip and run but actually they they can't always throw um or you've got some guys that haven't haven't worked on some of the technical stuff now again there is always a different time and there's a thousand reasons why but that's that's generalizing the entire country by the way but the, that's what it tends to look like now because of this sort of over indexing on the approach um and again just in your world i guess these are the four things so anytime we think there's a purpose or a stage the bits to consider so what should training look like what should the environment look like when it's about exploring boundaries um what what how should i consider feedback how should we talk to coaches how should we talk to each other you know when you're exploring boundaries your feedback should look very different when you're further into a different place of that thing so if you're if you're given a lot of answers or you're not given the space for people to even think or actually you're doing five minute session stoppages and talk probably not overly convinced you're helping people explore boundaries as well as you could be what does it mean for support when you let someone explore boundaries um and again if you can let people explore boundaries now one of the things we do know when we talk about game dropout and game dropouts massive when you when you look at the evidence and research behind it people are dropping out of the game because they they begin to perceive that they lack competency so it's not just about enjoyment it's around 
I no longer feel as competent as I did, or I'm starting to drop off in comparison to my mates and they start to leave the sport because of it. Um, and that's one of the, the kind of the pieces we've got to be a little bit aware of. Um, you know, we've got to be a little bit aware of when we're going through and saying, Let, let's do loads of stuff. Actually, some, uh, you know, someone who does tons of games, you will get players start to think, actually, I'm a, you know, I'm in a different space and I, I'm perceiving I now have less competency because I'm not a games player. Um, Jason, this question, is this not because the system is looking at um, athletes to develop and not rugby players? Look, I guess as a person responsible for it, I can tell you categorically not. Um, I do think that's one of the sort of commonly banded things that gets put around. You just want to develop big people. You know, in absolutely no way do we. What we want to develop is physically robust people who can play for a long time. And that is the priority. If you look at any of the physical conditioning stuff that goes on, um, it is all around, I guess it's all around um, how you develop a robust athlete capable of dealing with demands of the game. So look, don't be under any illusion. You know, the top of the game is incredibly physical, like actually quite hard to comprehend some of the, you know, the physicality at that, at that end of the game, like how fit, strong, fast people are. Now, we can't make, you know, what can't do is give you magic wand and go change it and turn everyone back into, you know, 14 stone athletes. You know, that's a reality. Now, what we can't do with good faith is put an 18 year old who leaves school anywhere near the prem without ensuring that um, they've gone through a load of robust stuff. In fact, most of our conversations in RFU are around how do we get this player prepped? It's around knowing that you need more time. It's around having some markers just to show you where people might be physically. Um, we're not trying to reach markers by a certain time in anyone's career. That, that in no way is the guide. The guide is to say, what do you think is a safe and appropriate level to make a robust athlete? Because we want people to play for 15, 18 years, not three years. And I think that's that's the big big bit we want to get to um again so what do we want explore phase your world we want broad exposure okay right or wrong personal development and i guess in in a sense we just want really big broad things like we want you to to try now in the adapt phase i guess i like the picture of the hummingbird because i think it's, it's starting to work out well what's the right tool for the job um if you've done loads of adaptive games then there is a point when you need to work out well actually I can see this challenge, what is the right tool? So if you look at the under 20s, it's around, um, and they're in that tactically adapt phase. They've come off the back of a really broad rugby exposure. A thousand tools, they've been down the middle eye of Aldi, and bought every power tool in the world. Um, what we now need to do is get them to, to work out which one to use at which point. Um, and actually what's different? So what might it look like in between adapt, sorry, explore and adapt? Um, well, I guess in training, what you would see, is um, for example, in explore, you'll, you'll, you'll give a lot of freedom and a, a lot of chaos. In adapt, you might have some specific problems you want people to adapt to. So if you're trying to coach a defense um, to recognize a work something out and, and actually the focus of your session is defense, then well, well, you would spend your time preparing the attack and get them to present some pictures that you want the defense to work out. If you want the attack to go and solve some problems, then you know set the defense some challenges and watch the attack adapt to it. And, and, You'd be a little bit more, and what you might see is a little bit more um, organised, I think. You, you still want people to adapt to the problem, but you'd probably organise the part of it. And there's less chaos, a bit more organisation um, in the thing that's going to help them unlock, um, I guess, the solution. So that, that's what it might look like. Again, in terms of feedback, um, environment support, just have some considerations around how those things will play out. So again, clearly, feedback in adapt phase. Um, you know, one of one of the things that's essential if you look at under 20 journey to prepare players to win a world cup as an adult they have a world cup experience as a um, as an under 20 player now that involves really short game turnarounds like physical preparation probably not ideal if you look at it um how much time do you have when you play one on day one then you're playing again on day five or six not a lot to unpack information so that they might get given information directly um again that, that is a skill to adapt to it if i just give you this information so you go out and develop to it because that's the reality of what they, they might meet in the Prem. And I think where, and what we see in the wider coaching world at the moment is a really polarised view. Sometimes it can say the top is wrong because it should all be about explore, but actually we need to accept, well, what's the reality at the top? And how do we skill people up on that journey? And I think that's that's our job. Um, I guess last on um, in the win phase, right? So when people are out to win and with England seniors, 
you know, do you do you think English seniors don't spend loads of time learning to adapt, exploring, um, trying stuff out? Of course they do. Um, but actually, when you talk about winning, I think winning is a frame. So, you know, the one thing you cannot control is if you win a game or not. What you can control with young players is, um, I guess, the parts of your preparation or your work rate, that you can win those things. Uh, I'm going to get up off the floor faster than John Mallet. Um, okay, I can win that. Probably, John, that's, I think that's even true right now. It's not true, fair enough. Um but you can control that. So if we want to talk about winning, you know, we talk about I, I can prepare better than the opposition. I can eat in a more appropriate way. I can do more things. So there's loads of things you can win. Um, we, we don't need to avoid the topic of winning because kids start talking about winning when they're three, right? My three-year-old daughter races up the stairs and shouts, I'm the winner. Like We don't have to avoid that as a topic, but I think you can push winning into a space. Well, win something that you can control, not something you can blame on something else. And then it's a really healthy thing, I think, to go and develop. Um, so I'll push through these quite quick, but there's three there's three kind of broad bits that we would work to develop in players um, who are young. Okay, so bits of awareness. So we want them to start off, they enter um, the pathway journey. The first thing we want people to get to is a self awareness, um, an awareness of self. Okay, so what that looks like, we'll ask you loads of questions. How did you feel? You know, Grimo, what did you think about when? Um, how was this? When? So we we will talk to people in that, in that way and get them to open up. Now somewhere in the middle of their journey. We want them to be more aware of others. So we walked into a room, um, that happened. What did you think about it? I thought this, or well, what did you think about that? I thought a different thing. We've had some great examples recently where one of the under 20 scrum halves using that kind of understand others point of view said, what, it's just, you know, so he got really annoyed in training about something, lost his head because his way of currently dealing with that kind of thing is he just gets really pissed off and shouts at everybody. Um, someone else just goes really quiet. Now his perception, was the other person wasn't didn't care wasn't interested and that was how he, it came out he said well he doesn't care because he's, he's not shouting and fighting about it and he's now in that place where he's going like oh he actually does care as much and we've been working with everybody to understand that people have a different view i think the last stage we want to leave the pathway with is high self-awareness high awareness how other people function then the ability to move other people uh, so it's critical as a, a kind of personal development journey when you leave you can influence other people um, you want to play senior international rugby, you need to know your teammates, you've been able to make them buy in and then move. So kind of really broad phases. The low, the, I mean, there is tons behind that, but I am racing through. Um, one of the skills I'd just, I'd push on you, your teams, your staff, like how much do you notice? Okay, so actually noticing as a skill, as a practice skill, doesn't happen enough because we're so full of information. Um, you know, we would know in our environment... The, the coaches will play games they'll square off to rooms they'll be up till 3am watching the game 40 times they'll come down the next morning like the kid the kids know like the sorry, cool kids like young people notice they look tired they notice they're short of energy um and actually the coaches were, were not noticing that they were being noticed being tired and what do you think the impact is on a on a camp when it's like that i think that's it's absolutely essential you take some time off and as a program lead just find the time to step back and like genuinely look and feel and sense like if you don't i think you're gonna uh, miss things i can't stress enough like about creating that space if you've got responsibility over a bit of the program to do so um so this bit what about talent okay so if i said to you now just quickly define talent for me um we, like we're probably now here till like tomorrow evening at 7 p.m Okay, um, what I thought might be helpful if I if I go through some myths. So in your typey boxes again. Okay, this time, just so we don't get biased by other people, I want you to type it and not press send until I say press send. Okay, because it's going to give us a live land. So I want you to type in the age at which you first think you can see a talented player, like a kid who's going to go through and make it. So what is the age? Don't press send. Just type it in the box. I'll tell you when to press end that you can see a talented player who's going to go through and make it. So everyone type for me just the number. And then I'm going to give you a three, two, one countdown. Ready? Three, two, one, send. Boom. Right, have everyone have a scroll through the ages. Let's see what we got to as a range. We're going to find a high and a low. Um, so I think I've got a low of seven and a high of 18. 
There you go. Expert consensus. We've got 11 years between us at this point. Um, interestingly, I'm going to ask Harty and Sigs to um, at some point find the, uh, the average of all of that and we'll um, work it out. But right. So what's interesting is if we just ask everybody here, um, when do you think you can actually identify an age when someone's going to go through and make it? We, we, so we, you know, like I'm not cheering you up, we've just done 11 years of age range um, with a group of people who work in development. Okay, so you're going to start to see some of the problems we get into. Um, even broader than that, like if you said to me, what is talent? Right. I think it's an issue. So I talk about sending out a talent framework. I don't think we're going to call it talent framework because it's going to assume that A, those things, then you're born with them and B, you can't develop a lot of them, both of which aren't true. If you ask me what age I can, I could identify someone we think is going to go through, honestly, it probably wouldn't confidently, and even then I wouldn't be absolutely set, probably not till 17, 18, um, would we do it in my world? Now, you know, good example, when, when Marrow was 18, I got told he'll never play Premiership rugby, um, you know, in places so you, you've got to be you've got to be aware like it presents very differently um some like i'll give you some some statements all right there is no benefit from early specialization so we actively encourage young rugby players to do low stuff go do cricket go do hockey go do athletics play some basketball play for as big like um you know we've done a world's best phd that looks at it but just generally you shouldn't be specializing rugby till 16 plus as a single sport in my opinion, you, you want, it gives you a load of kind of physiological benefits, gives you a load of other benefits. Um, the other things I think you need to kind of get around then, right? So when we talk about what does talent look like, so there you go. Um, there's Billy. Um, there's Billy Vinopola when he's a, a lad with his own teammates, same age. Um, now, interestingly, everyone will sit there and go, oh, Okay, and one of the questions is why don't you pick, um, you know, when will the academy stop picking uh, screaming? So, you know, stop picking screaming talent, do whispering talent. Now, here's the conundrum, right? So here's your talent developer's conundrum. Would you not put Billy in the system? Would any of you, look, you know, if he got to 14 years old and someone presented like that, would, would any of you not pick him? Because I think hand and heart, you, you would say, well, actually, there is a physical potential that might mean someone could play in the premiership. Okay, so that in note that doesn't say he's got everything or you would have everything to go through, but I think we also need to do it. Now, the challenges in the system, well, how do we ensure, you know, that um, the lad in the back with his cap on has as fair a chance? So you will tell me rugby is about fun and enjoyment. Now, if I turn up to your local club on a Sunday, would you hand on heart tell me you're going to give both of those kids equal game time up until they're 16, 17 years old and equal opportunity? Right. Like, hand on heart you tell me we're going to do that at every time now it's an interesting one because what tends to happen and i'll show you some data on it in a minute is we get caught by a load of bias and and by a load of kind of other stuff that can blind us so uh, i love this picture um, there's a great book by sarah jane blakemore um, on the adolescent brain okay so some things we know you can be an adolescent okay not just physically so we know that rugby is a you'd never want a talent ID until post maturation. So post puberty, when everyone's had a chance to grow, because clearly someone who goes through puberty at like 11, 12, it's going to look very different from someone who might go through at 14, 15. And that's, there's a huge kind of gap that you can go through. Uh, more than that, cognitively, you can have an adolescent brain, okay, neurologically until you're 24. Right. So when we hear about these mercurial players, you go off the rails at 21, 22. Um, you can be an adolescent to you 24. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Um, I love this picture because we, so what's what happens in your brain? So you never have more connections, more neurological connections in your brain than when you're at that sort of peak of puberty as a young person. So that that root ball on the right. OK, can we say so these are two root balls for those of you who are not keen gardeners. Um, that's what a, a teenage brain looks like. So when you work with adolescent kids and and. One morning, they walk into your school and you say, good morning. One morning, like, yeah, morning, Mr. Gaynor. How are you? The next morning, they throw their bag across the hallway, um, punch their mate and uh, storm out the school. Okay, it's because that brain it, it is wired differently. Okay, so what your adult brain looks like is the one on the left where you had a life of, of kind of making decisions. And, and so they talk about pruning. So your brain goes through a pruning process as you get older. You start to trim out all those little... Um, 
all those little connections and you're just left with these big trunks. So that presents differently. So think about a brain that, that is just chaotic and all over the place. So what might happen is someone's going to turn up to your rugby session and one day they, they could be completely normal. Next day they could be all over the place. Um, and it happens and, it, and that can present for a while. Um, so I guess you've got a, you've got a, you know, you've got a neurological, you actually have a cognitive difference potentially in players. Um, that's a physiological one. So here's some data for those of you who like a data sheet. Is it, is it clear enough to see the data sheet? Just a thumb up heart here. Yeah? yeah, cool. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 along the top of the screen. Okay, so Q1 means someone who is born in September, October or November. Okay, Q2, December, January, February, Q3, March, April, May, Q4, June, July, August. Okay, so look in that left hand column for me underneath Q1s, right? So right down the bottom, when we ran, ran Wellington um, as an under 16 festival, okay, and it used to remember, it used to be just an international festival, just an England under 16s team. Um, so when we ran it as an international festival, 40% of the kids who attended Wellington were born in September, October, or November. Okay, so if, if I asked you to to have a guess, like what would the percentage splits be? You'd all say, oh, probably it's like 25% of the kids, right? Across the year, they'll all be equal. Um, if you look at it, 64% of kids are born in the first six months of the year. So that either means that having a kid um, that's born kind of that second six months isn't good for talent, or it means potentially we make some mistakes when we identify early. And remember, this is academies making that decision, right? So this is academies making that decision, the talent experts who have all this information, and know about all these pre-existing biases. Um, when you get to the Prem, now this was just based on 2019 data, <coughs> so sort of excuse me with it, but the Prem on average, and certainly when you account for Southern Hemisphere difference, is about 25%, right? So the earlier you pick, the bigger the skew. And this is the same in all sports, football, hockey, basketball, like it, it happens all over the place, male and female game. I'll, um, I'll send a link round to a paper we've just published actually on it, which, um, We'll show you what, what England rugby's data looks like in both male and female games. So there is a relative age bias the earlier you pick. Um, again, flick it up. In the Academy League, right? So 38% Q1s, 26% Q2s. Okay, so again, 64% of players in the Academy League were born first quartile. Now, to, to show you what, I guess one of the other things that happens um, is more first quartile, just get your head around this, more first quartile under 17s get picked ahead of third and fourth quartile under 18s. Does that make sense? So the perception is you are a better player as an under 17, but all the people we think are better players objectively are born in the first six months of the year, again, as 17s. Okay, so we have a massive overrepresentation in in youth sport in terms of birth quartiles. Um, why? Probably because the older kids look a bit bigger when they start rugby. Now, the UK has a slight bias anyway, okay? So our birth dates are slightly out. But at under-14s level, okay? So at under-14s, those of you young people, that difference goes whoosh. So before under-14, it's pretty consistent. Now, what happens at under-14s? We go to big pitches and we introduce leagues. Um, now, I'm not saying it's that direct because we're still looking into it, but you get to this point when we say we're about fun and enjoyment, we introduce leagues and we whack kids on a big pitch. Now, who's probably going to fill a big pitch better and help you win a league? Um, and when what happens is those kids get the better coachings, they get in the A-teams and it kind of ex it accelerates that difference between the two things. So what does that mean? Look, what does it mean? And there's tons there now also equally understand that if you're a fourth quartile, you are about four times more likely to get into... Um, you get into a professional career. So if you're in it as a fourth quartile, if you look down here, if you're one of that under 16, 13%, under 18, Academy League 15%, you're actually way more likely to have a professional career. So chances are you have had to adapt to some stuff in your journey that's made you much more tooled up to deal with the long term. Because the kid has always been big. What happens anecdotally in your environments? It was always big as a, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 18, everyone's caught up and all of a sudden, just being big, where you used to run through people, you're saying, well, he's now skilled, efficient, can't catch, kick. He actually hasn't developed stuff. That's that's how it plays out. Um, so there actually, there is an advantage to being a fourth quartile that stays in the system. But again, and this isn't to bag the work the academies are doing because they are aware of it and they do a bloody good job. You know, one team brought zero fourth quartile kids to Wellington. 
one year. Okay, so you can't have a percentage of nothing that will go through in the game. Now, when we're talking about, well, why do academies pick early talent and why do they pick all these early things? Quite often, they're, they're drawing from pools that have already been skewed because at 12 or 13, when they came into school environments, I'd love those of you who work in schools. When you go back to competitive rugby, ask your lead teacher or coach with the youngest age groups. And once they've picked a team without mentioning it, just, just run the birth dates next to that team and stick them into quartiles and see how it turns out. Um, because it's not the answer necessarily to just split them all equally and give everyone each chance, but you do need to have that conversation because things like what's your birth quartile, what's your training age, what's your training history, they present differently. I could talk about this for hours, probably I'll need to do another one because I'll... Um, so, um, a good question, John, on terms of what we're doing. So, look, I, I asked you that question, what do you want in your team? <clears throat> I'm going to skip through bias. Um, I told you that I've done a beta version of an improved diagram. So, DPP, what's the big change in DPP in the last year? Is, well, it was under 13s, right? So, it used to start under 13s. <clears throat> when does DPP now start? Well, it now starts under 14s, okay? So, there's a whole year been taken out of it recently. So, if I, if I zoom in on this... Uh, beta version there you go it's pretty good this um so dpp doesn't start under 13s anymore it's been taken out okay it doesn't exist um it now starts at under 14s and again we're sort of looking at entry point of 14 should that start in feb half term onwards the other thing we've done is wellington festival look has been hit by budget but that will come back like when it's back it will be back as an under 17s festival okay not as an under 16s thing um there's this real mental edge um Harty's giving me a five minute warning so I'm going to go as fast as I can but um I'm in the I'm in I'm excited so it's very hard to control it um so what does it look like um we're taking everything up basically a year is the simplest way I can explore it so what what does all that mean we've taken everything up we've tried to take decisions out of everyone's hands so no under 13s DPP we asked about county 15s and DP and his county in all in all honesty actually the you know, should we have a county 15s team where you strip down to one team of players under 15? Um, no, not not in my view. Um, you should have DPP festivals where you have a broad number of kids um, who can all turn up and they can all play and they can all have that competitive experience. We want bigger numbers held for as long as you can so everyone gets the chance to do it. Um, skip through what I mean on that. Look, an example of my career, right? So I started my career and I would have, I would have, has anyone seen the Dunning-Kruger graph or not before? You might have done. Um, so I started here when I was coaching and I probably had like not a lot of information in terms of um, where I was, but I probably hung on it massively and thought I know everything about talent idea and this is where I am and this is what I want to, this is what I want to do. And, and actually, I think there is so much in this space. I just want to encourage you to go out and, and, and look about it and read. And I'm happy to come back on and do more depth on all of these topics. Um, but I think that's, that's one of the key bits that we want to get to. Um, it, it's just to kind of help everyone move past. And it's hard when you don't have a lot of it. So one of the questions, um, you know, just bear in mind in any, any kind of talent system, some people may not at the point be ready there are only so many resources and you can only go so far so will people be missed of course um will it mean it was the wrong decision like you know here at lancaster we'll talk about danny care actually being released out of the leeds academy at the point that might have been the right thing for danny at that point because it may have helped him develop up we talk about rocky road we know sometimes you would design in. So there's been players not picked for england 18 who were you know on performance be good enough because the right thing is for them to have that challenge as long as the system so the questions on county 18s earlier is it part of that central pathway at this point no because it's its purpose isn't to to get people back it's around retention and love for the game now should there be a connection between both systems absolutely you should be able to always move from one to the other and we've got to make those transitions as seamless as possible and we need as, as many eyes and as coherent a system as, as possible um, I don't think it's there yet but it's certainly an aspiration um, so again, you know, what, what do we want to work towards? And when we continue loads of entry, loads of exit points where the two kind of lines of rugby run towards each other, that's pretty critical. Um, it's kind of, I'm getting towards summaries now and 
look, I'll stay, if you can stay on, just I'll be another couple of minutes. So what would I encourage everyone to do who's in charge of a system? Um, delay decisions. If it's ever a decision about getting towards a best of something, delay it as long as you can delay it. Okay, the earlier you make that decision, the worse it will be. Um, you need to go and learn people's history. How long have you played rugby? Um, at what level? Where are you from? You know, will a kid who joined a rugby club at seven turn up at 14 to a trial better than someone who's just picked up the sport? Yes. Do they both have the same end potential they could play for England? Yes. Will one look a lot better than another one? Of course. So if you don't know the history, you shouldn't be making the decision. Um, and the other thing, you want to get as diverse as possible. So the phrase, many eyes, loads of people, many times, many environments. Don't make a decision until you've done them. Loads of people have seen you, loads of different times and a load of different places. Um, treat everybody the same but differently as a principle and that would be one of the sort of performance principles of this this system um so treating me well may look very different from treating chris sigsworth well we, we both might have a different idea of what well looks like um it's a really common coaching mistake to assume that actually we all want to be treated well in the same way we don't you need to find out so treat everybody the same but differently if you're getting towards performance then um again if, if people are early on their journey, just look, think about it as creating an experience, not being a coach or not being an environment. Like your job is to create a positive experience and engage in experience, um, like reframe it and go at it and, and encourage the people you work with when you're in charge to do that. They can get nervous around, like, I have to learn something now. Well, just say no, just give someone a good experience of it and then ask them some questions. Um, as a really hands-off philosophy when you're working with an experienced people, that's what I'd encourage you to do. Um, and I guess the key, so schools, colleges, unis, any of you who have players that are on a pathway, um, I think you all agree you want someone to do well and you want someone to succeed and do it. The one thing I think is missing all the time, everywhere, and where all the conflict comes from is people don't agree a decision-making framework. Um, and by that, I mean, we'll both go, yes, we want a player to succeed. We want him to have opportunity. We want him to develop. Um, but then a school game will clash with an academy game um and at that point you know all this sort of nice talk we've had would go out the window because we haven't agreed actually how to how should we make those decisions and what who should be in the room and how early should we communicate so there's loads of stuff that we try and put in place around it around annual plans other bits but like if you can like get in and agree those have those ugly conversations right at the front if you can i think they're absolutely critical towards people developing um I guess uh, last two bits, what are you are going to see from us coming up? Okay, so I told you about the talent framework. Um, we're going to try and push you in like I'm really, really genuinely happy to respond to feedback. So we'll do as much coach support, network knowledge stuff as we can. Um, and again, you know, talked about, um, you know, get diverse in your thinking. And, uh, we need to get diverse in our engagement with rugby, engagement population. I think as a sport, we, we need to challenge each other to bring more people into the game um, and to work out, well, what affordance should we give? Again, if someone's new to rugby, their their experience is different, it'll be less. Um, when you when you take someone with sort of less experience and put it near performance, the easy thing to do is say they're not currently performing at that level. Um, I think the conversation should be, let's get as diverse as we can in the game, um, in coaching, in refing. Let's, let's really embrace it. Let's work out the affordance we need to give at the start just whilst people get up to speed. Um, but it will be our point of difference. Like it's a superpower to England rugby if we get it right. And I think that's something we've got to be um, better at and challenge each other. So I've rushed the end. I told you I'll get excited and talk too long, Harty. But um, if okay, you mate, have questions, I'm here for you. So um, go for it. Do you want to say, there's a few people that have just had to drop out. Really, so oh, there might be a few more questions coming in, Dom. I was just going to uh, thank you from, from us, really. I mean, the, you can see the feedback in the chat. It's fantastic, mate. So... I think it's just given people a little uh, spectrum of how broad your role can be as well and so on. So, um, you know, it's an emotional thing, isn't it? And you've actually offered, actually, we're going to look to do a few more of these anyway, aren't we, as, as we go through. And um, some of you will be aware, actually, me and Chris are starting to look at the whole schools and college offer anyway. So this will all be part of the whole package that we're looking to do that we're going to, the whole visibility piece. And actually, when we get rugby back up and running, actually, how we reach out and support the, support the game anyway. So... Yeah. I'll let any of my questions, maybe, but I just wanted to, you know, give that, you know, final wrap up from me and just a massive thank you. Yeah.